Hey there, my name's Rod Yates and you are listening to Humans of Music, a Jackster podcast. Each episode I talk to a music creator or industry professional about their life and career, the ups and downs of their journey and the lessons they've learned along the way. And my guest today is singer-songwriter Brett James. For a while there, Brett James could very well have been Dr. Brett James. He was headed for a career in medicine before taking a break from his studies in the early 90s when he moved to Nashville to pursue a career in music. Despite landing a record deal quickly, he never broke through and after seven years returned to Oklahoma to resume his studies, his dream seemingly over. The universe, however, had different ideas. Three days after starting university again, he received news that Faith Hill had recorded one of his songs for her album, Breathe. And over the next five months, Brett had no less than 33 songs cut and ended up with five top 10 singles for the year, signaling the end once and for all of a career in medicine. He returned to Nashville and in the years since has had more than 500 of his songs recorded by artists as diverse as Bon Jovi, Kelly Clarkson, Tim McGraw and Keith Urban. He's written numerous number one hits and in 2006 won his first Grammy for writing Jesus Take the Wheel by Carrie Underwood. We talk about that rollercoaster ride in this interview and how Brett went from being the next big thing in Nashville to, in his words, a has-been, before resurrecting his career and becoming one of the world's hottest songwriters. We start, though, talking about the fact that after 20 years of writing songs for other artists, Brett has just started releasing music under his own name again. He started with the EP I Am Now, which comes almost two decades on from his previous solo single. You know, my, my 50th birthday was the inspiration. Honestly, I kind of woke up, I turned 50, and I was like, you know, I've, I've done a lot. I've been doing this business for a long time, and you know, and... You kind of, you kind of one of those moments. You have to reevaluate what's next in your, you know. I think we all have those moments. You know, it's time to like take a breath and go. Well, you know, what do I? What? How, how do I want to change? I want to keep everything the same. And for me, you know, I just kind of literally had a bit of a, a an epiphany that part of what I want to do creatively for the rest of my life is make music that I love for me. You know, and that was it. Was as simple as that. And because I've been writing for other people for so long. I love doing it. It's the greatest job in the world. But, um, you know, you're, you're not, you're not, A, you're not saying what you want to say. You're not using your voice. You're not, you're not, you know, communicating with people on a one to one level. You're not playing live shows and doing that. And when you do, you're singing songs that other people made famous. So you're sort of just a messenger, you know? Yeah. And, and so I really had this kind of moment where I, you know, that was it. It was like literally that's, that was my whole agenda was, I want to make some music that I love, you know, that, that I write by myself and perform that's, that's written from my voice. So what does that look like? And I, you know, literally that day I, I cleared my calendar for the next two weeks and I wrote probably 14 songs in those two weeks just sitting on my couch by myself, you know. And I didn't have an agenda. I wasn't trying to, you know, fit country radio or, or pop radio or any kind of radio. I was literally just like, you know, you know, my instrument is my voice. I've always been a singer kind of first, especially when I'm, you know, even before I came to town. If I came to town, I had a record deal immediately, you know. And so, um, but that was never kind of me doing me. That was me doing the country version of me or this version of me. And so this was kind of a journey into that. What do I, you know, what's the music that I would make if I could just make music? And I, I wrote about 14 songs and and started finding kind of a direction that I loved, that it that felt very natural and was easy for me to write and sing. And it turned out to be sort of what I would call Nashville soul record. It's, you know, it's kind of blue eyed soul meets kind of kind of Nashville streets, you know, yeah. and and that's how I would describe it. I don't know. Other people might describe it differently, but that's that's what it turned out to be. And um, when recorded it and I've just been having fun with it ever since. And I, you know, the goal is just to have enough success that I keep getting to do it, you know, yeah. and I have a reason to make more of it, you know, because it's, uh, I literally, I think I have more fun writing in those couple weeks or, and I've written several of the songs since as well, like tell the people I wrote recently. And, um, but I have more fun doing that than almost any any other part of my my job and my creative process. It's really yeah. been fun. Had you not had that impulse over the past at some point over the past twenty odd years to to do this? Well, you know, I mean, I, I, like I, I I did have. I mean, I had a record deals for about I, when I moved to Nashville. I had a record deal for five or six or seven years, and then I had another one for a hot minute. You yeah. know, and you know that was the last one was two thousand, so twenty yeah. years ago. And 
I really hadn't had that impulse in the last 20 years because I thought, you know, I've, I've, I've been down that road enough and my songwriting was going really well for most of the last 20 years. And I was raising kids and I didn't want to be on the road anyway. And I didn't want to do all the things that artists have to do because I, you know, I was really fortunate in many ways that, you know, the artist thing didn't work out for me because I got to be home and, and see my kids, take my kids to school every day and, and all that stuff that artists kind of sometimes don't get to do when they're touring all the time. So, you know, in hindsight, that was probably a blessing, but for the, you know, a long, for a really long period of time, that the artist side of me was just completely gone. I, I, I never even crossed my mind to do it. I was just very content to be a, you know, a writer. And, you know, I've always liked playing songwriter shows, mm. you know, rounds and bluebird shows. And, and some of the, they, they can be a, really fun but it's still a little bit different you, there's no pressure on you you can suck if you want to you're not the artist you know yeah people expect you to forget the words you know you you know he's been to those shows you know you're you're supposed to screw them all up so it's, those are for more for fun than anything else but um but anyway so I, I decided to, to put the artist hat back on a little bit and it's been just a blast just been having so much fun what were the nerves like when you actually first put out your own music performing putting it out was not hard but and so far, largely because of COVID, I've really only gotten to play one real big show. I did a city winery show here in Nashville and, you know, sold it out. And, and I didn't have my own band, so I hired the guys that play the Wallflowers now to be the band. They were spectacular. And I had these legendary soul singers and horn players playing with me, you know. And and the nerves were high. I'll be honest with you. It's different to play song, you know, play music that's yours as opposed to play songs you've written for other people. There's just... It's just there's a, it's a different it's a different feeling completely, and I was nervous as hell for a little while. You know, I got out there and just had a blast. But I think that's the first thing I told the audience was that I was nervous as hell. <laughs> <laughs> so when did you get bitten by the music bug? You know, uh, I grew up in a family that was very very musical. My mother was a classical pianist. Not you know she 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 had. She she quit all she quit to raise a family, but she was an amazing pianist. And my dad uh, was was not a professional singer, but he was a great singer. And so I grew up in church, and man, it was just singing constantly in my house and in my church. And and so, but for me, it was never, you know, it was just something I loved doing. I was I was pretty good at, and but I was always way you know my whole growing up experience was uh, sports were the thing, you know, whatever sport was on. You know, whatever sport was happening at the moment, I was playing that, and and music was always, you know, way in the background. And so it really wasn't when I when I had the urge to think I might be able to do it professionally. I was already in medical school. I'd already gone to undergrad, and was already in medical school. And I went and saw a, a, a concert by a guy named Steve Warner, who's a famous old country star in the U.S. And he was playing my hometown of Oklahoma City, and you know, I think I think every artist has to have this moment in their life at some point where I was in the audience and I'm watching him do his thing and he's amazing and he's a great guitarist and I knew I could never play guitar like that. But the the, the writing part and the singing part, it just struck me. I thought, you know, I think I can do that. You know, mm. if I put my mind to it, I think I could be that guy. And that's when the, the I guess the music bug hit me. And even though I was studying to be a doctor at the time. You know, I just started writing songs in my free time, just on my own, just trying to figure out what it would sound like and, and how that would look. And that's kind of that's kind of what led me to, to, to today. Even that's been a long, long time ago. Yeah. What did you grow up listening to? Because you obviously you said you grew up in church. What about other music like secular music? Uh, you know, uh, I, that's what I, I, I grew up listening to the radio. I was a total child of the radio, um, but not country music almost at all. I don't. I don't remember, you know, my parents were not country fans. Even it, it sounds crazy because I lived in a town through middle school in western Oklahoma, where, you know, half the country stars are from, and a, town, a tiny little rural town of about 2,800 people. I mean, tiny town. In western Oklahoma, you'd think country music would have been everywhere when I was in seventh grade, when I was 11, 12, 13 years old. I almost don't remember hearing a country song until I got to college. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. We were listening to, you know, Fleetwood Mac and, and you know, you know, just all the bands of the day, ACDC. And, and I was just, you know, soaking up pop radio my whole life, you know. And 
you know, it wasn't until I went to Texas. I went to Texas for college, for undergrad. And um, when I moved to Texas, uh, I remember my even the first day I was there, I remember just George Strait coming out of every window. And I was like, <laughs> who is George Strait? What is this guy? And, you know, I, and I was kind of hooked after after that. And so that's that's when I really kind of fell in love with country. Right. So if I'm right in understanding this, you you asked for your first guitar for Christmas when you were 19. You got your exactly right. I was a, I was a freshman sophomore in college. That's right. Why? I, I guess I just wanted to learn. You know, I wanted to learn how to play guitar. Um, I had grown up singing in church, but it was just so you know the guy with the microphone just singing. I didn't really play any instrument. And my mom bought me a guitar for eighty dollars for Christmas <laughs> that year at a pawn shop. The, the brand I still remember the brand was called a Lincoln. I've never seen one since. They were terrible. But you know what I did was I uh, to learn. I was really into John Cougar Mellencamp at the time. You know, this is that that era, and he had come out with an album called Scarecrow that I just, you know, still one of my favorite albums of all time. So I buy the John Cougar Mellencamp Scarecrow guitar songbook. You know, because I already knew how to sing the song, and I already you know, and they were all pretty simple, thank God. And so that I taught myself to play guitar to the John Cougar Mellencamp. Uh, Scarecrow guitar uh, songbook, and you know after that, for me, you know a lot of people they pick up a guitar and they want to really learn, master the guitar. You know, for me that was not it at all. I and mean, it was literally like the the second I learned enough chords, it was natural for me to try to want to write something. It yeah. was natural for me. To, I'm just I didn't know I was writing song. Make something up that something did you could sing on the on the porch for your friends. You know. And that seemed like the natural natural next step for me. So I, that's kind of how that all happened. But yeah, it's crazy. How far into your studies did they start to suffer from you just loving writing songs? You know, uh, I got pretty far. I went to seven years of college. Seven years of college. I went to four years of undergrad, which you, in the U.S. It's to, get, to, to, get, to be a doctor, it's four years of undergrad college and then four years of medical school. And so I did uh, four years of undergrad. I did two years of medical school. It's a really long story, but I had two years of med school and thought I was going to take a leave of absence and come to Nashville. Um, I got offered a record deal when I came on my first trip to Nashville ever, did, ever. and uh, you know I was on a on a holiday from on, on spring break we call it in the U.S. from from school. Got offered a record deal, came to Nashville, thought I was going to take a year off medical studies. Seven years later, after what I was giving up hope of ever being, uh, you know, making the music business, I went back and did a, a whole nother year of medical school when yeah. I was 30 years old. Isn't that crazy? So total of seven <laughs> years. But to, to be fair, two of those years were the same year. Once I went back, they were like, you have to repeat your sophomore year because you've been out so long. Right. I did my sophomore year twice. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the, what's the journey from writing your first? What, what was your first song, by the way? Do you remember it? The first song that I remember write, that I remember writing that I recorded and actually helped get me to Nashville was a song called About My Home State called Sweet Slow Oklahoma. I couldn't tell you in a million years how it goes. <laughs> that was on my first little demo cassette that I recorded. And, and what happened with that demo cassette? Do you gave it to a friend? Is that right? A friend who kind of had some connection to the industry? Yeah, I had a friend who's still a dear friend. Uh, her name's Deb Marklin, and she's uh, she helped. She worked for Arista Records. She helped start Thirty Tigers. She hasn't. She's quit the music business. And the oh man, she quit the music business like twenty years ago, almost now, when she started having kids. But her husband Steve Marklin is still a, a well-known publisher in Nashville. Deb and I had gone to college together, and she was an intern of all things in college radio promotion in Ann Arbor, Michigan. That was my one big, you know, connection to the to the, to the music business was an intern in Ann Arbor, Michigan. <laughs> but I sent that cassette that I recorded in Oklahoma to Deb and she gave it to her boss and her boss had been a big deal in the, in, in the music business in New York. And she liked it and she wanted to be my manager. Her name is Reen Nally and she said she called me one day and she said I like this music. Uh you know, can I can I take you to some meetings in Nashville? And I said, Well, I'm in medical school, but uh, I got spring break coming up. I can go to Nashville for spring break. And so she met me here, and that's what happened with that cassette. It ended up getting played for Tim Dubois, and uh, Tim Dubois was the head of Arista Records at the time. He was kind of the biggest wig of the big wigs back then. And you know, I met with a couple other labels that just patted me on the head and sent me packing. But Tim Dubois was the one that told me. 
Yeah, if I'm, he said, you know, if you move to Nashville, I'll give you a record deal. And he said he'd only said that to one other person at the time, which was Ronnie Dunn. Ah, oh, right. I, I took it pretty seriously when he said it. Um, and so that's that's what led me to finishing that year of med school and, and, and coming to Nashville to kind of throw my, you know, proverbial hat in the ring. It's funny because I just, we talked about Tim Dubois, you know, this is 1992. So this is 28 years ago. I texted with Tim yesterday and I wrote with his son, Chris, today. So we're still, we're still good friends. <laughs> wow. What, what's going on in your head at this point? You've just put all these years into a medic, like a medical degree. Now you've got this thing, which is probably a crapshoot at best. It's not an easy industry. What, what's going on in your head? Well, it's the dream, you know, I mean, I mean, I, you know, Nashville and music business and I think I think professions like this, you know, acting and, and music, all the all those kind of professions are for dreamers, you know, and you have to have that dream or, you know, and you have to know it's a long shot or you'd never try it, you know, and it's it's, it's always that question if, if, you know, what will I feel like when I'm 50 if I never tried it, you know, and, and that was kind of what it was for me. And I had this kind of opportunity, you know, fall out of the sky. So I, what I, and, and really I thought I wasn't taking a big risk. I really thought I was going to take a year off. You know, I was naive enough to think that you can really know if you're going to be a star in Nashville in a year, because that's not, that's not the way it works. Right. But I was naive enough to think that I could, you know, yeah, try it. And, 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 it, and if it didn't work out in a year, I'd go back, back to school. Well, seven years later, I did go back to school, but I've learned a lot in those seven years. <laughs> And, you know, it's funny, I didn't call Tim Dubois, you know, he's told, he offered me that, you know, the, the, the deal or whatever, he's, and he gave me his home number and just said, call when you come to town. I didn't call him for nine months after I moved to Nashville because I knew I wasn't ready, you know, I just, I just instinctively knew that I needed to get better before I knocked on his door again. And so when I came to town, I did like everybody else. I played open mic nights and waited tables at Midtown Cafe and, you know, got my own publishing deal, you know, and made some music. Finally, then I made some music I was proud of. And once I had some more music that I was proud of, then that's when I, I called him up. It was really about a year later after he, we had that first meeting. And I said, you might not even remember me, but I moved to town because uh, you told me to. And here I am, you know. And, <laughs> and fortunately, he, he, was, he was kind enough to like what I did and sign me, sign me to Arista. Was it an exciting time? Oh, yeah. Very heady. It was crazy. Um, because he was, you know, he was the kingpin at that time. One of two kingpins. He and Tony Brown were kind of the, the big shots in Nashville at the time. And, um, you know, if he told people that you were going to be the next Garth Brooks, they believed him, you know, <laughs> strangely. And so he basically told people I was going to be the next Garth Brooks. And so, it, you know, from almost the moment that he dubbed me that, I got treated really well. All of a sudden, I'm riding with every hall of fame writer in town and i'm getting treated like i'm gonna be a big shot you know and i think oh that's kind of cool and and uh and that's what was you know interesting about the, the whole process because when it doesn't work like mine didn't work and you fail pretty miserably like i did you know all of a sudden five years six years later now you're kind of a failure and you still have a publishing deal you're still working and you still might even have a record deal but you're kind of like you're kind of used up goods at that time. And so you kind of, you kind of go from being like the, the cool, bright, new, shiny thing to, you know, you're already, you know, you're already tainted and you're worn out and we've moved on and it happens pretty fast. And so that's kind of an, you know, it can be a real emotional roller coaster for a lot of people. Did you sense that, that that was how you were being regarded? A little bit. Yeah. I mean, I do remember, I remember in, you know, I, I moved to Nashville this is all, all ages me, but I'm an old guy. So I moved to Nashville in, 90, in 92 and I moved one. I, I went back to medical school in 99. So it was, but I remember like in 96, 97, 98, kind of like being embarrassed to walk into my publishing company. I was signed by EMI at the time. And I was kind of like, I, you know, I just, you know, I'm just a has been already at 27 years old or whatever I was, you know, and, and feeling that way. And, you know, and, and, it, it, it's humbling, but it's also, I mean, I think it's good for everyone to taste real failure. And I tasted a lot of real failure, you know, it was years of, of failing in, in the music business before I you know, had some success. And I think that it keeps you driven and it also makes you appreciate, you know, when you do have a little bit of success even more. And, and it also makes you, uh, 
I don't know what the word is, but you're a lot more empathetic with the people who are struggling too, because you understand how hard it is to to get lucky, like as I call it in, in this in this job. So, yeah, I think that I think that, I think I learned a lot from that period of failure. Failure. What um what kept you going? Because six seven years is a long time to persist when you're not being successful, and you know in the back of your head that you could go back to study medicine. Well, yeah, I mean, I think during that six or seven, you don't just like, and especially in, in when you're when a recording artist, you don't just, you know, your, your first album might have failed, but then you're changing producers and you're trying, you know, okay, well, Brett, here's what we think needs to happen. Now you're going to make a new album with a new producer. Well, there's three years of your life, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's always kind of the next thing. You're not like, it's not like it's just cut and dried. And then finally, when it was cut and dried, you get, when you lose your record deal, like I did, and when you, when you, uh, you know, your publishing deal, you know, the money you're making gets cut by two thirds, like happened to me, you know, or I'm walking around town, I can't even get a publishing deal for a while. You know, then you realize, and for me, it was, for me, it was just growing up. I mean, at that point, I was, you know, 30 years old and had two little kids. And, you know, we talked about dreams for a minute, you know, a second ago. It's a town of dreamers, but I, you, you, everyone does need to know when to let go sometimes of the dream because not everybody's going to make it and that's why it's such a crapshoot that's why music and sports and entertainment and all the things that everybody kind of dreams of doing are crapshoots because so many people don't make it Mm. and i had seen especially then this is the late 90s and when nashville was really on a huge downturn um the whole town was we went from about 1200 full-time songwriters to about 250 in about three years wow so it was a it was a big nosedive for Nashville, not just me, but I had seen I'd seen a lot of older guys who drugged their kids through you know the music business for way too long, you know, because there's always that hope of, it's going to be a hit. It's right around the corner. It's like mm. almost like you know going to a casino. You keep pulling that handle, and if it if it never comes up triple seven, <laughs> then all of a sudden you know you got a wife that leaves you and kids that don't like you, and it's, it's not cool. You know what I'm saying? And I've seen that happen enough, even as a 20-something year old, watched older guys kind of do that, that I just knew I didn't want to be that guy. And so for me, when I went back to school, it was really all just a, it was literally all about, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a grown man with two children. How do I feed them? Mm. You know, and all I'd ever done was go to school and, and, and be a songwriter. So those were the only, it's not like I could go get a job in business. I didn't have any qualifications. So those were kind of my two options. And I, you know, I knew... And I knew I was going to be broke for a long time, going back to school and doing all that stuff. But I, you know, I knew that at the end of the road, I would be, I would have a job, and that could feed my kids and hopefully send them to college someday. And that's really all I cared about. After the break, Brett talks about the moment his career took off, and recalls an unforgettable songwriting session with Steven Tyler. Welcome back to Humans of Music and my interview with Brett James. Before the break, Brett was speaking about his first stint in Nashville and how it didn't quite go as planned. And we pick up the conversation talking about the lessons he learned during that period. Oh, man. You know, the, the work ethic is, you know, is, is the main thing I learned and to not quit trying and to not, and to not quit sort of uh, experimenting. I mean, I think that... that Sort of what happened to me and happens to a lot of songwriters, especially, is we get locked into this, you know, here's the box that Nashville is writing right now, you know, and here's what's happening on on our country radio format right now. And if you're not doing that right now better, as good as everybody else, you're out. So you better damn well try to do that. And if you can't do that, you're out, you know. Not, it's not, not what can you bring to this that's interesting. What can you bring to this format that's great and game changing and, and not bring your own talents? It's like, okay, forget about all this other beautiful crap you've done your whole life. Now you got to do this, you know? And I think I got stuck in that a little bit. And for me, um, you know, the great lesson of going back to medical school was, was, was when I took off, when I went back to medical school. You know, I think you probably know the story that when I went back to medical school, uh, I had two cuts to my name and, you know, no money. And all of a sudden, I got, I was living in Oklahoma, going to medical school, and my buddy Troy Burgess, the 24 year old kid, he 
he was my co-writer that was willing to fly to Oklahoma and spend days with me writing songs when I wasn't going to school. And, you know, there was sort of this attitude of, okay, I got a job. That was a big relief. I'm going to have a job. I'm, I'm going to be able to feed my kids. So I can take that weight off my shoulder. I'm in Oklahoma City in my parents' house, about as far away from the Nashville music business as I could possibly be. And so it's sort of like, fuck it. Let's write what we want to write. Let's have, you know, let's be creative and, and, and make some music that we love. And Troy was young and cool enough to want to do the same thing. And so, you know, we wrote uh, a lot of hits, and I think we had five top ten singles. We got came out of that nine months, and I had I had thirty three of my songs recorded during that period of time. And you know, it was just a bizarre period of time because I was literally in Oklahoma City, and I'd be in pathology class, and you know, <laughs> and this is like right when flip cell phones would come on, and I'd see a you know a message from my my uh, my publisher and. I get on the phone. Her name was Kelly King, and Kelly would say, "Brett, Tim, McGraw, Tim McGraw just cut Telluride, you know, a song that I wrote for him, or Martina McBride just cut Blessed." And I'm like, "Wow, you know, I just <laughs> and, and I didn't have anybody to tell it to, so I, you know, I'd be in the library or something like that. I'd just be like, so I kind of just do my little dance, like look around, and going, <laughs> nobody knows this, but I just got a Tim McGraw cut, you know. So it was a, it was a cool time. That was that was really gratifying. Was it just the change in mindset? Do you think that led to that? I think it, I think that's mostly what it was. You know, for me, uh, and we talked about this earlier. I did not grow up really listening to country music, and so I was always I always felt I was forcing that a little bit. And what Troy and I were good at was what we kept, became good at was in this period, especially the early two thousands, country started leaning a little bit more pop. With you know, Faith Hill's "Breathe" album was my first big cut in that yeah. period. And we had a song called Who I Am on Jessica Andrews during that period that was very kind of kind of young, fresh, and, and very pop-leaning. And so I guess it helped me that, that Nashville's taste kind of came toward what I did better, you know? And, and, and so that helped. And then I just also just gave myself the freedom to do what I do, yeah. you know, best, you know? And so I think that it was a combination of those things probably. But it's interesting that even when you went back to medical school, you still wrote songs. So you didn't give it away. So there was still a little flicker of a dream? You know, uh, the reason there was a flicker of a dream is because I still had a publishing deal. Yeah. Um, I had a publishing contract, you know. And it was funny, uh, the guy that owned the company is a guy named Mark Bright. And you probably met Mark. Mark's a dear friend of mine. He produced all the Carrie Underwood records and things like that. So Mark's a big deal. and And so... I remember that I, like I said, I'd been struggling to find a publishing deal. Mark offered me a deal. And I was his only writer. He and his song partner's name was Kelly King. And I was the only writer at the company. And about a month after he offered me this deal and I signed it was when I sort of had this thing, okay, I got to feed my kids and I'm going to go back to school. So I had this interesting breakfast with Mark one morning, and it was, it was at Pancake Pantry here in Nashville. And I take him to breakfast and I said, look, man, I, I know I'm your only writer and we've only been working together for a month, but I need to feed my kids. So I'm going to go back to medical school in Oklahoma. And Mark, who has kids himself, you know, was incredibly understanding. And he everybody gets that. And he looked at me and goes, man, I totally get it. But here's the thing. I mean, you got a contract for a year. You might as well write songs while you're out there. Just do the best you can. We'll see what happens. And. That's what happened. So I ended up, you know, I did that year of med school and quit again and came back to Nashville. And- yeah. When you went back to Nashville for that second time, what were you determined to do differently? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, well, first of all, I had success. You know, I'd had, I mean, Troy was being my songwriter of the year that year off of the songs that we wrote. You know, I, I was not because I was being my, I split my songs between being my and ASCAP. But at, we kind of came back, I kind of came back as one of the really hot guys, you know, and that drives you to want more success. I mean, that's an interesting thing about success is it drives you to want more success, especially I think in, in our little business, you know, if you're writing songs every day, doing your best work and you feel like nobody cares at some point you run out of gas, you know, and that's kind of where I'd gotten. 
But now all of a sudden, it seemed like everybody wanted the next song I wrote. And so that motivates you to want to write about 150 of them a year, you know? And so, <laughs> so that's when kind of for me, uh, that work ethic kicked in and I just, all I did was write and record and write and record and write and record for about the next decade, you know, just nonstop, just slamming, 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 you know. And, uh, you know, those were some really fantastic years, just some wonderful years for me. Did it change your perspective on success, having already been what you'd been, uh, been through what you'd been through? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, you know, I, I have this little saying, you're never as hot, you, you're like, you're never as hot as you think is when you're hot and you're never as not when you think you're not. <laughs> but that's pretty true. You know, I think, you know, I think you, you, when you, when you struggled a long time, you, first of all, you, you don't want to do that again. So you just work hard out of whatever it is. You work hard out of fear or out of drive or whatever, but you just don't want to go back there. Um, but it also, you know, like I said, it also makes you realize that there are there are there are so many more talented people than me who have not had the success that I've had, you know, and that is humbling. It's truly humbling because you go, you know, I, I'm just not taking credit for a lot of it, you know. Um, you know, uh, there's guys that I can name that I think can write circles around me that, you know, have never had a real hit, you know, some of them, and so and that that happened, you know, and so. I think it just makes you kind of more maybe 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 gives you a little sense of how lucky you are to have some success and and that it's really not all about something brilliant that you pulled off <laughs> you know you just it just the the, the the sevens lined up on the on the you pulled the handle and the sevens finally lined up so just thank god for it and you know keep swinging i guess you know yeah what was your what was your relationship like with your parents throughout all this because i know your dad was in medicine as well so how like how did that conversation go the first time you told them you were going to give songwriting a go and drop out of medical college and then as your career took off did they come around to your way of thinking <laughs> well you know what's funny about my dad was he was uh like i said he was a great singer and he he was one of those guys he was a doctor but he always had that what if in the back of his mind, you know, what if I'd have tried it, you know, what if I'd have pursued, you know, my talent. And so he was always nothing but supportive. I mean, you know, when I left med school the first time, when I went back, you know, when I left again, he just like, whatever you got to do, you know, do it. But especially the first time when I said, look, you know, I've got this opportunity to do this thing. And he thought he, it also helped that he thought I was great. You know, he mm-hmm. thought I was really good at writing and singing. My mom, the classical musician, not so much, you know. <laughs> it took her, <laughs> I bet I'd had 15 number ones or 10 number ones before my mom ever was like, she kind of came around, you know. Like she realized that, <laughs> that this hokey country music that my son is doing for a living is actually, now it's feeding his family. So that's cool. It must be, <laughs> something must be doing, you know, working. And, um, but she was funny because she, for a lot of years, she just, you know, she just hated everything about country music because she's a classical musician kind of snob. She was. And then, but when she came around, man, it was, she was all in. Then she became like super fan. And, you know, <laughs> and one of those that, you know, every person she sat next to on an airplane, she had to tell what her son did. And that got, that got a little crazy too. <laughs> they both kind of had their own way of coming around to, to, to the, to the job, you know? Right. So when you think of all the songwriting sessions that you've done, are there any which stick out to you in terms of um, providing you with lessons or, or songwriting sessions that you took something away from that really changed the way you thought about songwriting? Oh, that's a really great question. Um, man, I think, and, you know, I mean, I, I couldn't count I, how many I've done now. I know I've written over 3,500 songs, but I've been saying that for a long time. <laughs> it's a lot of songs. You know, like I said, I did one today with, Brent Anderson and Chris Dubois, who, you know, are fantastic. And I learned from both of them today something. You know, I think the thing is you learn every day. They're, they're the, you know, they're the ones that stick out where you get to, you know, if you, if you get super lucky, you get to work with some of your heroes. And song, songwriting heroes and artist heroes and both. And, you know, I mean, like one, one that always pops into my head just was – is working with Steven Tyler for the first time from Aerosmith, you know, 
Um, you know, when, the first time I wrote with Steven, I think I was his first co-writer in Nashville. He was doing a Nashville kind of country-ish record. This yeah. is not that long ago, five or six years ago. And so I get the call from Steven's assistant that, you know, he's getting close. And I, I my studio was in a barn at the time. There was a long driveway that came down to my barn. So I decided to go out and wait out front for him. And I was nervous as hell, you know, from a Steven Tyler coming to my house. You know, it was great. <laughs> and so... So I'm nervous. All of a sudden, this you know, around the corner, this 1979 Silver Shadow white Rolls Royce cruises down my street in Brentwood, Tennessee, and turns into my my long driveway to come down to my my barn. And I, I kid you not, Stephen is hanging out the passenger window, <laughs> waving a feather boa, and singing all the way down my driveway. <laughs> You know, just doing his thing, you know. I sat there just just in awe, first of all, and knowing that, that I literally thought, this is, I will never forget this as long as I live. This just doesn't happen, you know. Steven Tyler is singing down my driveway right now. And, you know, I mean, like, for the thing that I learned from that cat and the reason he got to be Steven Tyler is, man, he just, is he just writes it from the gut. You know, there's kind of, there's a, there's there's two different spectrums of writing. There's writing from the gut and writing from the head. You know, there's the analyzers and the ones that just let it flow. And man, Steven is a guy that I, he's like, you know, he's like a, he's like a walking, breathing instrument. He literally, that's what he is. He's a, he's a, you know, he's a, he's like a, a jam box or something. I don't even know what to, how to describe it. But he just lets it roll, and the joy that comes out of that for him is awe-inspired. Quite honestly, you just you just kind of you just want to be around it, which is why he got to be Steven Tyler, you know. And <laughs> and uh, so that you know that's just an example of something I learned. And sometimes because sometimes we overanalyze, we overthink, we over, we second guess, and you know part of the reason I like I said I wanted to make my album without any constraints of all that is just. Because that's the joy of music to me, you know, mm. just kind of letting it come from the heart, from the gut, wherever, whatever you want to call it, and uh, and uh, and not trying to kind of overthink things sometimes. And he's good at that, you know. Yeah. And 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 yet I say he doesn't overthink, and then his lyrics come out brilliant, you know. I mean, you think of some of the stuff he's written that it just blows your mind, you know. So it's it's something special there for sure. Yeah. Have you you mentioned that joy of just music and songwriting have you ever lost sight of that joy even while you've been having success no question about it i think i think i think that ebbs and flows a little bit and i think for a lot of writers it you know i i always describe it and, and this is and this is this is kind of more applicable to you know day in day out professional songwriters who are not necessarily people who are writing their album every three years I and mean, that's a different kind of take but when you are a professional day in day out songwriter, you're writing a hundred songs a year. You know, you're 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 when, when you're cranking, you're cranking. Um, I would say there's a bit of an arc to it. You know, that there's there's this there's this path when you when you, if you haven't been writing for a little while. It takes you a little while to get up to speed, and then you and then you crest, and man, you're just at the top of your game for a little while, and it's all just flowing, and it's all creative, and you know. If, if you're good, you're just spitting out stuff that you don't even know where it came from because you're just in your zone. You know, it's like being an athlete when they're peaking, you know. And then there's always that other side of that crust where you start to get a little burned out. You start to go, oh, I've written too many days in a row. I've written too many songs lately. And you're just like, ah, oh, and I'm losing the love for it. So you kind of have, sometimes you just got to step away, you know. And I think that's important. You know, I think all creatives have to recharge their batteries somehow. Yeah. And so I think it's it's just important to know know when to dig in and sometimes when to step away and realize you know you know I'm just gonna if I write today I'm just gonna be forcing it I'm just not I, I probably don't have anything to give so I just should probably go for a walk you know do something else today you know yeah. and I think or take a vacation whatever it is you know so. is it still a mystery to you songwriting um yes and no. Yes and no. I, I, I mean, the, the the nuts and bolts of it are not a mystery now. You know, I mean, I've done it enough to know that the, what the nuts and bolts of writing 
of songwriting look like, at least traditional songwriting. You know, what, what we think of as certain song forms, certain rhyme schemes, all that kind of stuff. You know, you've kind of done that enough that it be, I've done that enough that it becomes second nature and it's not a mystery. It's just the way, of, the way it works. It's like building a car. You don't, you don't build a car. You know, you're going to put tires on it. You know, you know, you're going to have a steering wheel. It's kind of, or it's not a car, it's something else, you know, <laughs> where the mystery kicks in sometimes is like, like I just said, when stuff flows, you have no idea where it came from. You, you know, you don't, you you know, it's, you know, sometimes it's better than you are. It's, it's smarter than you are. And all of a sudden something just laid itself out before you and you just thank God that it, it's there and, and don't know why, but you just, you were lucky to be in the room that day or just lucky to be the little antenna. So that's, that's kind of the mystery, you know, to me. And it's also the kind of the beauty of songwriting is, is that it's, it's ever evolving, you know, I mean, and, and this doesn't apply as much to, you know, certain, it doesn't necessarily apply to my country as much probably because country kind of sticks to certain forms and certain things. That's what makes it country music. Mm -hmm. But there's always the next thing that no one's ever heard before. And it's probably as some kid in their bedroom right now, you know, making some, writing some song that, that, in some form and some with some phrasing that has never been heard before and it's backwards and it's upside down and it's different. And maybe this time next year, that song will get heard enough that it changes everything just a little bit. So everybody wakes up and go, wow, that was a game changer, you know? Um, and, and that, and those, those happen almost, you know, pretty constantly, you know, this, this year was, uh, you know, this year was Billy Eilish or last year, two years ago. I would say it was probably Billie Eilish, you know, and I'm, you know, and I'm not sure her song form and all that, but whatever she did was fresh. Mm -hmm. It was different. You know, whatever she and her brother did changed the game a little bit and they did it in a bedroom. And so somebody's doing that now that's going to be Billie Eilish, you know, two Grammys from now. Yeah. I think that is also the mystery of it that, that you know, just when you think you've dug every layer of, of writing songs or making music or making art, there's always some other layer that, that nobody's quite gotten to yet. And, and that's kind of what keeps me interested, you know? After the break, Brett talks about the people who have mentored him and how his successes and failures have informed the way he relates to young songwriters. Welcome back to Humans of Music and my interview with Brett James. Brett has his own publishing company called Corn Man Music, through which he mentors young songwriters. I asked him about what kind of advice he offers them, which is where we pick up the conversation. You know, I, I'm, I'm not big on giving advice, honestly. It's not, you know, I don't know that it's my place. Um, you know, when, when they, if they ask, then I'll, I'll throw out whatever I got, you know. But the writers that I sign, I sign because they're super talented and usually more talented than me. <laughs> so, you know, you know, theoretically I'm mentoring them, but the truth of the matter is I, I, they're mentoring me, you know, they're teaching me how to, how, how, you know, how to, how to think like a 22 year old, how to, how to write like a 22 year old, because, you know, uh, you know, and so, as I get older, I, I find myself listening in rooms a lot more than, than taking over and charging through, you know, I think, and I think that's, I, you know, like I said, I mean, you, you, one would think that the, 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 you know, you kind of set up a publishing company with that being a, a part of what it is, is maybe, you know, help, I'll help mentor and develop young writers, but maybe develop, you know, we give them the opportunity to shine, you know, and a lot of them have turned into some of the, we've had some insane success stories before in the top 20 right now, for instance, in our little publishing company, you know, and that's great. And, but, uh, you know, I, I, I have to say that I learn way more from them than they do for me. And, and, and that's just the honest to God truth. You know? Yeah. And, and, and I can't keep up with some of them. You know, I've got some writers right now that are just, I mean, they can get into co-writes that I couldn't, I can't get into now. You know, they can do, they, they literally, you know, they can, they're, they're that hot and that good and that fresh that, you know, the, the biggest artists in, in the business want to work with them. And, you know, 
it's just because they're that good, you know. Yeah. And, and so that's really fun to see that you know you you meet a guy like I'll use Josh Miller as an example. You know, I met him. He started riding for us like three years ago, four years ago. I don't know, but he's just had insane amounts of success, you know. And he's working at a kiosk in a mall, and you know. All we did was put him in the right rooms and he all, you know, and he does his thing and everybody freaks out and he'll be a legend one day, you know? Um, and, but it's fun to see guys like that, that you kind of just, you got to be there when they got their first shot and then it turns into, you know, making a lot of history. I mean, Joshua meant to be and for FGL and, and you know, and cut after cut after cut after cut. Yeah. We've had some great artists come through, Kit Moore, Caitlin Smith. Now we got a guy named Drew Green who just who just came out. We just uh, dropped his first music last week, and uh, Drew is. I'm just insanely excited about about Drew. He's he's the guy that I've never like. I would say I haven't seen anybody on a, a writing run like he is. I, I it's, it's it's I can't remember ever maybe you know. And wow. I'm so excited for him. I'm managing him. I decided to become a manager because. <laughs> <laughs> this guy is so freaking good. I want to I want to spend more time in his world, you know. So, yeah. you know, you're always trying to kind of do new things and challenge yourself, and that's what I'm doing. And you mentioned earlier that because of I guess the struggling years, you developed an empathy for people who were going through that as well. Um, how does that inform the way that you deal with young songwriters and young performers? Well, you know, it, it is it's it's very interesting because I give them a lot of grace. You know, I give them a lot of time to to develop and to learn and write bad songs. You know, uh, you have to have that time. I mean, I, I was lucky enough to come to Nashville when it was such a such a boom town that literally almost anybody that could play three chords and sing a little country could get a publishing deal. And I was allowed to write hundreds of bad songs. You know, I, I was lucky enough to have a record deal that helped. But I wrote hundreds of bad songs to sort of learn how to write some good ones. And, you know, I, I think I'm a lot, maybe a little more patient than some publishers would be. Um, I'm also a writer, which changes your attitude. Most, you know, a lot of publishers aren't, you know. And so I've, I've been literally in their shoes and still am every day. I'm still trying to write hits, you know, every day. So I think that makes, you know, the team aspect of it a little different than, I'm the business guy. You're the songwriter. I'm going to tell you that's a good or a bad song. I think, and I do think they trust me maybe a little more. You know, I think it. Uh, you know, if I don't give them a lot of advice, I just I'm just not that guy. You know, I don't give my kids a lot of advice either because ultimately I think you learn from living and I. You know, but you know I do think that it helps that you know I that I've, I've had some success, written some songs they like. So if I do say you know maybe. Maybe that second verse isn't quite right, or maybe this, 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 you know, you can juggle this a little bit better, do this a little bit better, you know, because I, and I say those things so rarely that I think when I do, they mean something. And I think that, I think that's important. Okay. So that's um, your relationship as a mentor. What about people who mentored you? Any, any names spring to mind and, and what they taught you? Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, I think of Don Slitz, you know, Don's, Don's a dear friend and, a, you know, one of the songwriting legends of all time. I learned a lot from there. There was a period where I was Don's a, a lyric writer, and he kind of quit writing melodies. So there was a period where I was kind of his melody guy. I learned a lot from Don. I learned from some great publishers like Pat Higdon, Steve Markland. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of other writers that really influenced me coming up. Um, there's a, there's a, there's almost too many to mention. I, I you know, I, I've gotten to write with you know. Some of the artists, some of the Hall of Famers, the Hall of Fame songwriters. I remember the first time I ever write, got to write with two Hall of Famers in the same room. I've never been in, a, I've never been in a room with any Hall of Famers, and I got to write with a guy named Charlie Black and a guy named Rory Burke, were my first two Hall of Famers. I just thought, wow, what is that even? Who gets in the freaking songwriting Hall of Fame, and what am I doing here? You know? And, <laughs> were you intimidated? Oh, I was incredibly intimidated. But then, you know what you learn. They don't know any more than you do. They just they're just figuring it out too. Ultimately, you know, <laughs> nobody's got the secret code. Nobody writes a hit every day. You know, nobody nobody doesn't miss. Nobody always writes great songs. So you kind of learn that you know that's and that's kind of what you know that's where I am now. I'm like I've been doing this a long time. I'm supposed to be one of the guys that knows what I'm doing. And no, I don't. I don't. I probably don't know you know more than the 18 year old kid that just got off the bus. You know and. And that's kind of what makes it fun too, you know, um, is that 
You know, we're always learning from each other. And that is the beauty of collaboration. You know, I mean, like with my project, with my album, I, I really enjoy writing that stuff by myself, you know, because it, it forces me to dig in. It forces me to sit there by myself and get out of my comfort zone and, 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 and do something and not have somebody in the room or on Zoom now, you know, going, that's great, you know. It, it, it kind of makes me kind of dig a little bit harder. But the beauty of collaboration is, especially artistic collaboration, is that every day you're creating like this whole, you know, today I was with two other writers. And so the, the three of us kind of create one entity that doesn't exist. Mm. It doesn't exist before or since. And it, and it only existed on this day, this, this way. If the same three writers get tomorrow, it's a different entity. It's a different writing thing. And so I mean, that's what makes it kind of beautiful as you get in these, in these you know, creative spaces with creative people. And, you know, today I might lead the, lead the charge. You know, I might have all the ideas. And tomorrow I might not have any of the ideas. But, you know, we're, we, and we, songwriters and us can give each other a lot of grace with that, too. You know, we're always, you know, we don't, nobody expects anybody to be on all the time. So it's, it's, it's a great, great community. And, and in that regard, the community, you know, having, having done this now for 28 years, is my favorite part of the whole job. It's just getting to be called one of the one of the songwriters in Nashville, you know, because we're a pretty small group and smaller every day, unfortunately. And, you know, especially the ones in my, you know, there's there's different generations of us all. So some are closer than other, others. But uh, just getting to be just getting to be one of the one of the kids that gets to do it is, is still a blast. Yeah. So Jackster is all about giving credit where credit's due. Who would you give credit to for helping you get where you are today? I mentioned Tim Dubois. I mentioned Steve Markman. I mentioned Pat Higdon. Mm-hmm. I have to mention Nate Lowry, who uh, is my has been my right hand, runs my publishing company. He's been my song plugger for the last you know thirteen years. I have to mention Kelly King. Um, these are like song plugger for those who don't know in Nashville. Those, those are the people that sell your songs. They don't really sell them, but that's for for lack of a better term, they're your salesperson. You're creating a song. You know, you're creating something to sell in the marketplace, and it's their job to take it to producers and writers and, and record labels. And Nate Lowry's been with me for 13 years, and before then, it was Kelly King. I mentioned her. She got me 165 cuts in about a seven-year period of time. Wow. So those songs don't get cut because somebody's out there fighting for it, you know? Because it's her job, it's their job to say, you're missing this. This song is better than that song you think is better than this song. This is the one, <laughs> you know? And that's sort of their job, and the people that do that really well, uh, uh, you know, change your life. Yeah. And that's why, I, you know, as a publisher, you, I'm passionate about that because I want my team doing a better job than anybody else. You know? Nice, Brett. Thank you so much for your time. It was it was really great to talk to you. Oh, what a pleasure, man! You, you're you're a great interviewer. I, a really great interviewer. You should do this for a living. <laughs> <laughs> And that's it for another episode of Humans of Music. A big thanks to Brett for his time and thank you for listening. This episode was mixed by Lachlan Mitchell from Parliament Studios in Annandale and the incidental music and theme song were written and performed by Sam Lockwood. Please remember to subscribe to the Humans of Music podcast so you never miss an episode. Feel free to share it amongst your friends and please jump online and rate and review it. And remember, for the rest of the year, Jaxter Pro is free. So if you make music or work behind the scenes in the music industry, head to jaxter.com and sign up to become a Jaxter Pro member. Until the next episode of Humans of Music, I'm Rod Yates. Thanks for listening. <laughs>